All right, good evening and thank you so much for joining us on this nice evening. I do see it's raining outside, so that's, I guess, an okay time to be inside for a recycling workshop here on a summer evening. I wanna quick do an introduction. Caitlin, I don't know if you wanna come up on video so we can quick introduce ourselves. My name is Emily Barker. I'm a solid waste specialist with the city of St. Louis Park. And my co-presenter tonight is Caitlin Steinberg from Hennepin County. Hi, yeah, I'm Caitlin from Hennepin County. I work on waste reduction and recycling. Perfect. So to the, this evening, we are going to go over a few different things related to our city and county ordinances as it relates specifically to multifamily because we do have some very specific rules because usually cities aren't involved with providing service to multifamily buildings. So we do have requirements that buildings need to follow. We're gonna spend a good chunk of this evening talk about talking about what you can and can't recycle, really trying to focus on the basic things and encouraging you to stick with the guide as much as possible. And then we're gonna present a few resources to help you recycle better, or if you're someone in your community that would like to help encourage your fellow residents to recycle better. We'll provide you some resources so you can connect those and then we'll have some time for questions. I do want to mention that if you find tonight interesting and feel like your property management might also benefit from a, a workshop, we do have one for multifamily property managers that will be geared more on the how to provide the assistance and the ordinance piece on July 7th and that's during the day. Um, we'll have that as a resource in case you want to pass that on. I wanna start with our goal for the evening, and that is with recycling in general, we wanna reduce trash overall, but we don't want to do it at the expense of quality recycling. And what that means is, yes, we wanna get as much out of the trash as we can for environmental and economic reasons, but unfortunately there is a lot of contamination out there and it's really our job as recycling educators to help you all understand what those things are and why they cause problems. So that is, that's our goal with recycling education. A few things specific to multifamily that create, can create challenges and that's different than single family. One of the main ones is the high turnover, just the nature of multifamily being mostly rentals. It does mean that there is a higher turnover rate than there is in single family homes, which means there's not as much consistency within multifamily communities. And that can, that can create some challenges. The knowledge of residents varies largely because the education that's provided by properties can really vary quite a lot. And that can, be, if folks are moving from community to community, the, the information that they can get can sometimes be really quite different, especially if they're moving from greater Minnesota or another state, it can really vary. Signage can vary a lot, and we will show you some examples of that here in a few minutes. The shared recycling containers like dumpsters and centralized recycling stations can make it really difficult to provide feedback directly to any given individual. Uh, and in our single family homes, we're able to tag carts and provide that feedback directly to that household, but we don't have that opportunity in multifamily buildings. Another challenge can be language barriers. And then the last thing that can often be an issue is inadequate service capacity, which means that the dumpsters are not small, are too small or not serviced enough. And that means that sometimes recycling and trash end up in the wrong containers simply because people just put them wherever there seems to be space. Because of some of these issues, a couple of years ago, the city of St. Louis Park amended our recycling ordinances as they relate to multifamily buildings. We have two different places, mostly in chapter 22, which is our solid waste ordinance. And I realize that this is a lot of kind of the ordinance may not be that interesting, but we wanted to provide this information this evening because we felt like it was really important for residents to understand what the what the rules are and what the expectations are, especially if you feel like your building is maybe lacking adequate recycling service, we'd like you to be able to have that information so you can go to your property manager or come to the city or the county for assistance and say, you know, hey, I think we're missing out on some things here and would love some assistance. So the first that we, thing that we did was create a minimum capacity. And this means that 
if you have a building with 50 units and there's only one small dumpster, it's just simply not going to be enough to ensure that there's enough space for everyone to recycle, especially with all the cardboard boxes these days. This is really, really important. So we did some calculations and figured that 20 gallons a week, which is still kind of small, it, but that would be a pretty reasonable number to require. This means that it's about one cubic yard per 10 units. Most properties have either four, six, or eight cubic yard dumpsters, and so that's that's often what you see, but sometimes, especially when they're carts, um, it's really easy to see when there's not enough capacity. So if you have questions about how much capacity your building should have, if you're wondering if there's enough, please do reach out to me and I'd be happy to let you know. The things that are most relevant to residents beyond that are the recycling location. So the recycling needs to be available to tenants at all times. It can't be in a locked space that's only open at certain times, and it needs to be in close proximity to the garbage containers. Now, this can be a challenge in some buildings, especially in older places where they don't have two chutes, and so you have the garbage shoot but then the recycling is in the basement and we do require if there's space on each floor that recycling be present in those garbage and trash rooms sometimes unfortunately because of the size of those rooms that would be a violation of fire code and so we're not able to require that but we do have some other ways of working around that to ensure that residents are very clear on where recycling is and how they should um, where they should take it the next piece is education, and this is something we'll spend a little more time talking about later, but we do require that all properties provide residents a copy of a recycling guide when they move in and then annually thereafter. This means that when you move into an apartment and you're handed your lease or whatever other documents you receive, you should be getting a recycling guide. We do allow the option of doing a digital guide if your property is one that opts for digital communication with all residents, that is an acceptable option. We have links uh, on our website to the county recycling guides. But ultimately, print tends to be the most common way that multifamily properties communicate with you all, with residents. So we do usually see that, and Caitlin will talk a little bit later about how properties can get those resources at no cost. The other thing is signage, and we have two different places where signage is required, the f or two different ways that signage is required. The first one is if there are chutes or containers that are owned by the property. So if you have a recycling chute that you don't go down to a container, you never see the dumpster, those that should be labeled and in fact say recycling and have pictures and clearly indicate what goes down that chute. If it's a say a larger container that then is dumped downstairs or taken downstairs by property maintenance, that container needs to have that labeling. If residents are putting their recyclables directly into carts or dumpsters that are owned by the hauler, then the hauler needs to put that signage on there. And we'll, I'm gonna show you some examples of signage that does and does not meet those requirements. Here are a couple of examples of signage that meets the requirements and the explanation of what those requirements are. So we have a minimum size, and Caitlin will actually talk about, because they actually have a larger minimum size. Um, we had adopted our changes before the county did, so they're slightly in conflict, but for the city ordinance, it's a minimum of eight by 11. We require that the recycling symbol, the chasing arrows, be present at least once on the signage. We require that there be pictures. And this goes back to my comment about sometimes there can be language barriers. Occasionally that's that's because of a different, if somebody speaks a different language as their, as their primary language and isn't sure what the signage says, or also if there are children that are taking care of the recycling, we wanna make sure that the text isn't what we're relying on. And so we do require that there be pictures. We do also require that the word recycling or recycle, recycle or even like mixed recycling or single sort recycling be present somewhere on the cart and the signage as well. So here's a couple of examples you can see. These ones have opted to use the county labels, which Caitlin again will talk about in a few minutes. Here are a couple of examples of signage that do not meet the requirement. Now, both of these signs are actually large enough. I don't have a great example of ones that are too small here, but the main thing is you'll see there's a lot of words. And in addition to the potential language barriers, the reality is, is that 
I mean, let's be honest, nobody, we don't read these types of signs when we see them, when it's all a lot of text. It's just not how our brains work. It's not, unfortunately, how we're trained to, to look at things. And so these types of signs, by and large, are just not very useful. And so um, we, we don't want to see all text. You'll also see the one on the right doesn't have the recycling sign. So if you can't, if, if um, language is an issue, is a barrier, it's really not clear here what the signage is for. All right, I am going to stop sharing and turn it over to Caitlin for a moment to share some information about the county ordinance that is ever so slightly different than the city. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about Ordinance 13, which is Hennepin County's Recycling Requirements Ordinance and has specific things for multifamily properties. Um, so Ordinance 13 is something that's actually been around for a while, but we recently amended it um, and had some changes put in that were approved just a couple of years ago and um, were officially effective as of this year. There are a lot of similarities regarding um, multifamily recycling between Hennepin's Ordinance 13 and St. Louis Park's Recycling Ordinance. Um, so a lot of what I'm going to say is going to sound familiar to what you just heard. Uh, both ordinances have requirements to provide education to residents uh, when they move in and then every year after that. Uh, requirements to label waste containers and ensure that waste containers are easily accessible to residents. Um, our ordinance also requires that properties provide adequate service levels for the amount of waste generated. And this will hopefully pair with St. Louis Park's minimum capacity requirement and ensure that there's enough room for recycling in the containers and prevent overflow. Um, all of our labeling requirements include uh, the additional stipulations that they need to be color coded. So labels need to be blue for recycling, green for organics, and either red, black, or gray for trash. We need to have images. And um, the sizing minimums that Emily was talking about, so for our ordinance, we require that labels be a minimum of eight and a half by 11 inches um, on carts, so that's like just a sheet of paper, um, and a minimum of 11 by 17 inches, so like the size of a poster for dumpsters. And we actually even have labels that are much, much bigger than that too for even larger containers. Um, property managers are required to label containers inside the building, like in community spaces and, and entryways. And we have the same um, stipulation as well that haulers are required to label their carts and dumpsters. But um, I do want to point out that managers uh, or property owners can, can label them as well. Um, although this ordinance did go into effect earlier this year, I do want to point out that we're not yet in a place where we're actively enforcing it. Um, we hope to spend this year letting people know about the ordinance and then get into more enforcement um, in 2021. All right, the next part is probably the part that more of you came for just because it's usually where we get the most questions and that is what to recycle. So Caitlin and I are gonna kind of tag team on this. She's gonna start a little bit about sort of how to prepare recyclables and then I'm gonna go into specifics in each different category of recycling. I'm just gonna do all those. All right, so yeah, before we get into what you can recycle, we're gonna talk a little bit about why it's important to recycle right. So there are a lot of items that can cause issues for recycling, and they typically fall into one of these three categories you're seeing here, safety, operations, and contamination. Some items that go into the recycling can cause safety issues for the people who work in recycling sorting facilities. Some items are issues because they just don't work with the way sorting facilities and their equipment operate. And some items are issues because they contaminate with recycling. I'm going to go through a few examples of things that cause issues for recycling and how you can instead recycle right. So the first item is bagged stuff. Um, something that consistently seems to be one of the hardest recycling habits for people to break is bagging, recycling, and plastic bags. We should not put our recyclables in plastic bags like we do with trash. Plastic bags are a source of contamination and they cause a lot of operational issues. They trap other recyclables inside and people who are kind of pre-sorting will pull the whole bag off the line, meeting all the recyclables inside and may not get recycled. And the bags themselves get caught on sorting equipment and bog up the system. So instead, 
we recommend that you do not bag your recyclables at all, ideally. Recyclables can be put in your cart or dumpster completely loose. If you need to use a bag for some reason, you can use a paper bag and dump the bag out into the cart. The next one is small stuff. So very small things do not recycle well. There are a few ways to figure out if something is too small to recycle. Some people say smaller than a credit card or smaller than your fist or smaller than just like two by two inches. Um, these tiny items like bottle caps, plastic ramekins, bits of paper, they're a big source of contamination, especially for glass recycling. The way we capture glass at the sorting facility is to break it up into small pieces and then let those pieces fall through the system. As you can imagine, other small things will fall right on through with the glass. So what should you do? Most tiny stuff should just go into the trash. But when it comes to bottle caps, there's always the question of leaving caps on or caps off. So if it's a plastic container with a plastic cap, you can leave the cap on and recycle them together. If the material of the cap is different from the material of the bottle, like a plastic cap on a glass bottle, then you should take it off and put the cap in the trash. So then our next one is opposite, really big stuff. Um, so very large items are not recyclable because of their size and sometimes their material type. Equipment at sorting facilities are designed to capture very specific items. So when a giant children's toy or a filing cabinet shows up, which I have seen, it can spell disaster for the equipment. And additionally, most large items, especially when we're talking about plastic, they're made of plastic types that we don't want in the recycling because they need to be considered contamination. So how can you get rid of large bulky items? So first, we would recommend you take a step back and see if the item really needs to be thrown away in the first place. Large items are often very durable, so maybe donating the item if it's still able to be used would be a step. Also consider if it's something that you can repair and reuse. So at Hennepin County, I wanna call out that we do offer monthly fix-it clinics where you can bring almost anything in and a volunteer will help you fix it for free. Unfortunately, um, events are on hold right now, but we'll hopefully have an online option soon. Um, and finally, if you can't donate it, give it away, repair it, repurpose it, then it should go in the trash. And lastly, so we have dirty or full stuff. This would be things like greasy food containers, bottles or containers full of random stuff like napkins or wrappers, or containers that are still full like that crushed Gatorade bottle we see here. Items like this are an issue because of contamination. For example, that Gatorade bottle would have been recyclable, but now it's either gonna to be too heavy because it's full of liquid to get sorted properly, or wherever it ends up, that liquid will probably turn things super sticky or eventually get moldy or cause some other kind of mess. So when it comes to dirty or full stuff, be mindful. Take the extra second to rinse the food out, dump the liquid out, and remove the napkins and wrappers. Not everything needs to be deep clean, but some items, especially things like peanut butter jars, do need some additional cleaning before going in the recycling. Awesome, thank you, Caitlin, that was great. So the next thing we wanna talk about is a term that many of you may have seen or heard, and that is wish cycling. And we wanna bring this up just because it does get a lot of media play. So recycling is the act of recycling things that are accepted in your program. So they're laid out in a guide from your recycling hauler or from the county for the city, and they actually can be collected, sorted, and then sold to a manufacturer who wants to make something new. Recycling ultimately all comes down to someone at the other end needing to be able to make it into something new. Otherwise, there's no point in collecting that material. Wish cycling, on the other hand, is the act of putting things in that you hope will be recyclable. And then, unfortunately, there's no process. And so it either ends up being a contaminant or being thrown away. And I always sort of joke about it's like folks want to just throw things in and hope there's kind of like a magic fairy at the other end that will that will recycle those things. And unfortunately, uh, there aren't. And we just would like to keep those things out in the first place. I'm going to start with a kind of back and forth, a yes, no, different categories. And the first thing I want to start with is paper, just because it tends to be one of the primary things that everybody has. And 
most of the yeses are pretty obvious things. Your mail and your newspapers and your phone books, if you still get one, we encourage you to opt out if you don't need one. Cardboard, which we have a lot of, cereal boxes, shoe boxes, boxes from your toothpaste, all those sorts of things that kind of thin, we call paperboard or, or thin cardboard, all of those things. The place where we get in trouble is all of the other random paper things. And this can be admittedly kind of confusing. But here is a list of items that we do not want to see in the recycling. And this is pretty universal around the Twin Cities Metro. Um, I would say that maybe except for shredded paper, which most most facilities have said now at this point that they no longer want. But besides that, nobody wants any of these things in the recycling. And there are a few different reasons based on the different kind of categories that Caitlin mentioned. Shredded paper, for example, is that tiny little stuff. And especially if it's not bagged, but even when it is bagged, it just sort of explodes and it's like confetti all over the recycling facilities. And it just makes a disaster of a mess. We do really encourage you to find shredding events. There are kind of limited right now with COVID, but there are some out there, um, or just to really minimize what you actually shred in the first place. Paper towels and facial tissues, we unfortunately see a lot of these in the recycling, and I think it's just because they are paper, but unfortunately they're very low grade paper, and of course with facial tissues, they also have bodily fluids, so we don't wanna see those in the recycling for any reason. Paper towels are just kind of the end of life. Recycling Paper can only be recycled so many times and it's kind of the end of the life for paper and it does need to go in the trash. Now, if you do prefer, um, excuse me, participate in our drop site program for multifamily for organics, there are some other options. Um, I'd be happy to answer those later, but otherwise, paper towels need to go in the trash. Paper cups and paper plates, unfortunately, these are not things that can be recycled. This is for a variety of reasons, partly due to co coatings that can be on those materials, but also the fact that they're often contaminated with food, and that just doesn't mesh well, as Caitlin was mentioning, with the recycling system. So those need to be trashed. Freezer boxes tend to be a thing that can be confusing for folks, because it seems like, why is that different than a cereal box? It often has to do with other materials that are embedded in the paper or coatings that are on the paper. So anything that comes from something that was stored in the freezer, so frozen pizza here, those do need to go in the trash. Ice cream tubs are in the same boat. And finally, wrapping paper. And this is a thing that we see a lot of certain times of the year, especially around holidays at the end of the year. But again, this is very low quality paper. And unfortunately, it often has other stuff like foil or other materials that are mixed in, and it just ends up being um, too much of a problem and a contaminant. Same thing for tissue paper. We do encourage you to think about options that you could recycle, though, like newspapers or old magazines or maps and things. That would be a much better option for wrapping. Metal. Again, hopefully most of these things are ones you're familiar with. Please always recycle your food and beverage cans. Um, surprisingly, even though aluminum recycling has been around for a really long time, the capture rate for aluminum is only around 60% in Minnesota. So that means that we throw away about 40% of the aluminum cans. So there's one message here today, it's like, Recycle the things that you definitely can. If there are certain things you can't remember, just always get those things that we can recycle. And one of the number one things are food and beverage cans. Uh, other things are cookie tins. So kind of the ones the you know that you get cookies in that are like the size of a plate around. The really big ones like popcorn tins can be a little bit tricky. Sometimes those can be a little bit too big, but most kind of tins that things come in are fine. That also includes pie plates. Um, those are aluminum, aluminum trays. The important thing there again is that they're pretty clean. You don't have to use soap when you wash them, but they do need to be free of food. For metal no items, these things, a picture here, are unfortunately things that they see all too frequently at the recycling facilities, especially propane tanks, the little ones. This can be super dangerous. If those get punctured either in a collection truck or at a facility, they can cause explosions and major fires. And so they unfortunately, um, are, they're, they're something we never want to see. The other random things in the upper right-hand corner are things we actually found in a sort of St. Louis Park recycling a couple of years ago, 
they're kind of just the metal bits. The one thing that is nice is most all of the things pictured here actually can be recycled. They just can't be in your regular recycling. So there are many scrap metal facilities around the, the Twin Cities here in St. Louis Park where you have one in um, Hopkins called Express Metals. They will take pretty much all of that. Uh, and then there are some other places that will take propane tanks. The county will actually take the really small tanks, but they won't take the larger ones. For glass, <clears throat> I know we see a lot less glass now than we did, you know, even a decade ago, but all glass bottles, food, uh, food beverage bottles and containers can be recycled. So all of the things you see pictured here. The things that can't be recycled, oh, my image seems to have disappeared, are drinkware, dishes, mirror, mirrors, and windows. Unfortunately, we see a lot of this and none of them can be recycled. The primary reason for things like dishes and drinkware is the drinkware glass is not the same type of glass. It's either got other things that are added or it melts at a different temperature and that creates contamination in glass recycling. Same thing with ceramic dishes, those cannot be recycled, mirrors and windows. So those things, if they're usable, then please donate them. Otherwise, they do need to be placed in the garbage. Plastics tend to be the category that people have the most confusion with. And to be fair, it's it can be confusing because things change um, uh, all the time. So this is the category of items, categories of items that we encourage you to recycle. You can see pictures here. But generally, it's going to be the bottles and jugs. That's kind of the main things, whether those are for food or things like shampoo or laundry detergent. Those are great. Um, containers like yogurt containers, again, as long as they're clean and empty. Yog uh, cottage cheese containers, things like that. For plastics that we don't want to see, we never want to see bags. I know Caitlin already said it, but this is one of the top contaminants and the biggest problems for facilities. As you saw in that one picture, they get wrapped around all the equipment, and that is just something we never want to see. That includes any sort of film bag, whether it's a grocery bag or the plastic that you take off, you know, around a case of soda bottles or things like that. All of that cannot go in the regular recycling. Now, it still can be recycled. Right now, most of the programs at retail places like Cub and Target are closed due to COVID. The county is still collecting plastic film at their facilities in Brooklyn Park and Bloomington, and hopefully those retail programs will start back up at some point as well. Those do need to be clean and dry if you're going to recycle plastic bags that way. The other thing we see a lot of is utensils. And while I appreciate the effort, plastic utensils cannot be recycled. This is for a couple of reasons. Usually they are made from a plastic called polystyrene, which has no real recycling markets, and they're flat. Most recyclables need to be three-dimensional to get through that sorting system that Caitlin was talking about. So a, a thin, skinny fork is going to fall through in the wrong time and most likely end up as a contaminant in the glass. The other thing, and I realize I have a typo here, that should say plastic tubes, not tubs. Um, plastic tubes like toothpaste tubes, these unfortunately are not recyclable. This is for a few different reasons. Sometimes they have other layering, but often it has to do with the shape. So these cannot go in the regular recycling either. And then the other thing we see a lot of is styrofoam. And while I have a cup pictured here, this also includes any sort of packaging like you might get with electronics or any sort of thing you might get in the mail for padding materials that's foam. So all of the styrofoam does need to be placed in the garbage. One thing, just a little more detail on plastics, the numbers do matter. And I know that they can be very confusing. So I put a little, a little, chart here. We will share these slides later so you'll get a PDF of this if you want to look at it more closely. But the different types of plastics, well, um, you know, technically polystyrene can be recycled, for example, that number six plastic, there just isn't a lot of demand for it. And so that means that effectively it's not recyclable. And so in our region, in Minnesota, especially the Twin Cities, the numbers that we generally can recycle are one, two, four, and five. And you can see here that's the bottles and jugs primarily, and then the yogurt containers. And the nose are three, which is PVC. We don't usually see much of that in, it's not really used in food packaging, but you might see it more if you get things at the hardware store. Number six, which is polystyrene, and number seven. And seven is 
sort of a mess. It's everything that's not one through six, and it includes um, things like compostable plastics, which can never be recycled in regular recycling. The last category of items is cartons. And the ones pictured here, so milk cartons, soup cartons, all of those can be recycled. Um, there aren't really any no's in the cart category of cartons, so I don't have a slide for that. But the main thing for this is that they do need to be clean. So milk cartons, you really do need to be rinsing those, otherwise they can get moldy and really gross. So please do make sure that you rinse those. One final slide I want to share is other problem materials. And this is just a small list. I realize after the fact that I should definitely have batteries on here. Batteries are something that cause an, a large number at, of fires at recycling facilities. There's several throughout the country every year because of batteries, especially lithium batteries that get crushed and then they create fire. But sharps and needles, so that includes things like EpiPens. Unfortunately, they see a lot of these at recycling facilities. It is actually illegal to put them in the recycling due to the safety issues. Sometimes this is an honest mistake where people are using something like a milk jug and or a or a laundry detergent jug and they place it in the recycling um, unknowingly, but they definitely cannot go in the recycling and need to be properly disposed. String lights or electrical cords, again, like the bags get wrapped around things. Multi-layer packaging, which is basically a fancy name for things like a Capri Sun pouch, and then snack bags and wrappers, so chips and things like that. Unfortunately, none of those can be recycled in our recycling programs. All right, we're going to share a couple of resources. I've listed here a few from the City of St. Louis Park, and then I'll turn it over to Caitlin to share a few from the county. The guide here I actually wanted to share because you all will hopefully see it within the next month in the park perspective. So we, while we require your property managers to provide a recycling guide, we also like to try to do, do that as well. And so for every so often we put it in the park perspective, which is a quarterly newsletter that you should be getting in your multifamily building. If you're not, please do talk to your property managers. Sometimes they get put in the mail rooms and don't get distributed. But you will see this as an insert that's going to be in that, um, in that publication. So do watch for that. It's a great one you can put up on your fridge. We do other articles and, and tips and tricks in the park perspective as well. We have a website that listed there specifically for multifamily recycling that includes um, the ordinance information as well as digital links to the recycling guides. We have an e-newsletter. If you aren't not already on that, I'd be happy to get you signed up. Um, it's about quarterly that we send out tips and events. We do a number of things on social media. We have a recycling champion program. If you're interested in being an advocate for recycling as well as waste prevention in your building, we'd love to have you join us. We usually have an in-person training every, every October. It will probably be digital this year, but we love to have multifamily residents because having you in, in the building and on the ground is a great way to help educate your peers, your neighbors. And then when we do have events, we, we do events. Not this year. so. Yeah, I'm just going to share some additional resources that we as a county offer. A lot of these are going to be similar to what Emily just described. Um, so this is kind of a quick overview of our resources, um, totes and guides and signs and labels, and I'll go into each in more detail. But I, I do want to note that although typically these are things that um, I'd see a property manager or an owner come to me and ask for, it's not to say that you as a resident of your building absolutely can't also take advantage of. Um, you may need permission from the building to put up signs or pass out things to other residents, but if you get that permission, then you can order these materials and be that resource um, for your building and maybe formalize it and be a recycling champion. Um, so some of the things we have to offer, so we've got our recycling tote bags. This is probably our most popular offering. Um, you have one per unit and people can use these to bring their recycling down, dump it out and bring the bag back up instead of plastic bags. Um, it's one of our main tools in finding plastic bags going into the recycling. Um, and you know Emily talked about their recycling guides. There's just a few more images. We have a, um, a lot of translations of recycling guides. So if you know your building maybe has a large Spanish-speaking population or 
um, of our Somali speaking population, we, we have some information uh, to share for that. We also, in addition to recycling guides, have a plethora of other handouts and informational material. If your building really struggles specifically with um, bulky items, maybe passing out some information about reuse and donation opportunities would be helpful. Or if your building really struggles with batteries, some information about batteries and so on. Um, here are signs and labels, just a few options. Um, so the recycling and trash signs come in multiple sizes. Um, that poster on the right um, is supposed to go kind of you know, anywhere you want it to go in your building. And at the bottom, you can write specifically where the recycling containers in your building are located. Um, all of these resources are available typically on our website on an order form that is not up right now um, because of coronavirus. Um, but hopefully, we'll have those back sometime in the near future. But they are all free. We especially, you know, want to emphasize that because, you know, we do have these ordinances and these requirements for buildings to have signs and labels to provide education, but we, we want to help buildings be successful in that. So we want to help provide those signs, labels, and educational materials. Um, some other things is, you know, we offer us, um, county employees, city employees, as assistants. Um, so we can come out and do a site visit at their property to help see what, um, what help or what changes might need to be made. We can give presentations. We can be a personal resource, someone to call or email when you have questions. Um, and the county also provides grants. Um, so these are especially if a property wants to get started with organics recycling and wants some extra funding to do so or needs to make some recycling improvements. So we do have to mention that there are some limitations right now because of COVID-19. Um, so Right now, mailing and delivery of physical resources and a person out to the property is on hold. Uh, but we are working on safety protocols to conduct site visits and get that stuff started back up again. Um, we can do virtual presentations. Uh, we can still connect via phone or email. Um, and people can, properties can still apply for grants. That process is still happening. So I just want to point out a couple of web pages to take note of. Um, one would be just our Hennepin Apartments Recycling web page. Um, if you don't want to like copy down the whole link, if you just go to hennepin.us and search apartments, you'll find it. Um, it has all this information we've been talking about. And when order forms and resources are available, again, that's where you'll find that. And then I also want to call out the Green Disposal Guide. This is an online resource where you can go and if you have a question about an item or something that you know maybe isn't recyclable but you don't know what to do with it, this would be your first stop. You can go to the Green Disposal Guide and search any item and get helpful instructions on with it and how to get rid of it properly. The county does take a number of things like the film and batteries and electronics and things like that. So things that your apartment may not have the ability to dispose of on site, you do have that ability to take those to the county. Um, the one thing I did want to mention that I didn't under our resources is that we do, if you would like to do more beyond beyond regular recycling, we do have an organics drop site program, which is available to multifamily residents. Doesn't matter if you live in an apartment or condo, and it's where you can take your food waste. So if you're interested in learning how to participate in that, you can go to that multifamily website link that I had for the city, uh, stlouispark.org backslash MF for multifamily recycling. And that program is free. We provide you with a starter kit of compostable bags, and it just gives you an opportunity to get a little more stuff out of your garbage. And that is a place where you can take food scraps, facial tissues, paper egg cartons, and a few other items. We provide you with a guide for that as well. I'm just going to throw my throw this last screen up here for people. Who, I will go ahead and send out this information as well as a follow-up. The recording of this presentation, as I mentioned, will either be on the city's YouTube page or the program we're using, WebEx, generates a link that I'll be able to share as well. And so we'll have, a, we'll have the ability to see it there. Um, if you have any questions beyond that, though, feel free to email Caitlin. 
you can call me. This is my work phone number, so I get voicemails at the moment because I'm I am working from home, but I'm happy to return a call um, anytime and connect with you. Uh, if you have questions and I am available to do some on site as well, some on site education. I can't do regular workshops in person yet, but I am able to come as long as everyone's wearing masks and keeping distance. I'm able to come and do some on site stuff right now if folks are interested. Okay. Well, with that, I am going to. Oh, actually, there is one more question. Any suggestion on how to deal with overflowing recycling bins? That's a great question. One of the main things, as I mentioned, is we'd want to make sure that you have complete capacity that meets the requirements from the city and the county. And so if I have an idea of how many people or how many units are in your building, I can figure that out pretty quickly what the requirement would be. I would say the big thing is breaking down boxes tends to be a big help a lot of programs a lot of multifamily buildings will actually have separate places for cardboard boxes specifically either not in a container in a separate area where they can be piled or in a separate dumpster an actual cardboard only dumpster and that tends to be one way to really cut down on the overflow just because if people put boxes in unflattened it takes a lot of space and that can fill a bin up very quickly and that tends to be one of the main main reason that that happens and that can definitely take some work one of the things some buildings do is they do have a, a camera if you can put we talked to the property managers about that and if you can kind of do some education that way and helping people you know if you can figure out who's if you've got one or two people who are doing that on a regular basis that can help um, one of the things to keep in mind is the overflowing can be a real challenge. Their haulers often will cause will charge overages. So something to keep in mind as a resident is that those costs eventually come back to you. And so it is important. There's a financial incentive, even though it may be indirect, to keep that recycling in the recycling bin because the haulers can charge an overage charge for things outside of the bin. Um, because it's essentially capacity that you're not paying for, and so they'll charge extra. So that's just something to keep about, keep in mind, especially in condos. It can be really effective to use that message. Apartments kind of depends on um, how receptive folks are to that message, but that's a good thing to remind people of. But one, I'd be happy if that's a regular issue at any properties to come out and kind of take a look. Please do think about sending me photographs, I'd be happy to take a look and kind of see if there's other issues going on besides just the cardboard. Any other final questions? All right, well, thank you again for participating this evening. We really appreciate you coming out and would, would encourage you to share this video with other folks, share the recording, and please send us questions anytime that you have them. Thank you so much. Have a great evening.